All right, amen and amen. Now, um, Romans chapter 1 will be our starting point. Now, have your Bibles. You can go, you, you, uh, go with me in your Bibles. Uh, I, I, because of technology, we'll be able to put it on the screen. And uh, as you follow me uh, in this teaching today, amen. Let's just make our declaration whether you have an electronic Bible or whether you have a paper Bible. Let's make this declaration. This is my Bible. Is my Bible. Say it like you mean it. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I am a believer, not a doubter. I am a doer, not just a hearer. And my life is the better after having heard the word of faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen. Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 1, our subject is going to be embracing the lifestyle of faith. Romans chapter 1, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall, what? Amen. Now, y'all got to talk back to him. The just shall what? live by faith. So we don't talk about uh, embracing the lifestyle of faith, embracing the lifestyle of faith. My kingdom assignment today is to stir you up in faith. Amen. And I am so blessed uh, that I'm standing here in the place that faith built, the faith dome. Amen. And so uh, on, on this, your amazing 50th year, it's amazing. Um, I just, I, I, we honor everybody. Uh, we honor Apostle Price, of course, you understand. But then, you know, we honor the present pastor of this church and the vision that he has for this ministry. Oh, no, y'all got to do better than that, y'all. And in our culture, the foundation of faith was laid uh, over 50 years ago, uh, really by the Apostle Price. He laid the foundation for us, and many of us gravitated to it, and many of us uh, made application. But it's, it's, when you talk about living by faith, it's more than just a word. You have to embrace it. Now, you can be exposed to it. You can be exhorted on it. You can be educated in it. But until you embrace it as a lifestyle, you will not see the supernatural results that God has for you. Amen and amen. And so, the scripture that declares, God was asked, do you think the faith movement is over? I said, absolutely not. The Bible says when Jesus comes, he's going to be looking for faith. Amen. Now, uh, the faith message is old at the, as old as the Bible, and of course, it was uh, Apostle Price and others who jump-started it, you know, 50-plus years ago, but it will always be around because it is God's plan to meet the needs of people through their faith. Everybody say that. It's God's plan, it's God's plan. to meet the needs of people, the needs of people. through their faith. Through their faith. Now, <clears throat> The message of faith came to me um, uh, uh, at a very low point in my life, low point in my life. I had just gone through a church fight, and uh, I was now in a very, very low place. Please put the picture of, my, uh, of uh, the first picture that you all should have of the little raggedy building where my church was. I need y'all. Yeah, now that was my church in 1980. That was my church in 1980. People look at me today and they really don't understand where I came from. But I'm there in that little raggedy rundown building. I have about 50 borrowed chairs, but I don't have 50 members. I'm ready to go back to work and God says, no son, I don't want you to go back to work. I'm gonna teach you how to live by faith. I'm going to teach you how to trust me. I told God, I don't wanna know. I don't wanna learn. <laughs> I want to go, no, no, I said, I want to go back to work. Now, understand, I've been, I've been, I got called to preach at nine, preached my first sermon when I was 10. They made me wait a year because they wanted to make sure this little nine-year-old guy who said he heard from God, they want to make sure I was serious. Well, I'm 70 now, so I've been preaching 60 years, so I think the little boy was serious. You understand? So, but now, I've gone through some stuff with church fights and church folk. I'm ready to go back to work, take care of my family. God says, no, I'm going to teach you how to live by faith. I'm going to teach you how to trust me. So as a reluctant student, I said, 
okay, amen. And it was there in that little raggedy building. Oh, y'all saw it. Y'all got the inside. Oh, now that's on a Sunday morning, and you look close, you see a bunch of empty chairs because I'm a full-time pastor trusting God, and God says, I'm going to teach you how to live by faith. No, no, don't show that building just yet. Don't show that building just yet. Now, watch this. And so, God began to talk to me about faith, the fundamentals of faith he began to teach me. But see, I hadn't heard him anywhere. I hadn't heard him anywhere. I was, I was, I was, I mean, I was taught in the Baptist church to believe the Word of God was true. I could see it, but I was not hearing anybody teach it like God was talking to me. Amen. And so, I began to, uh, I began to, uh, faith began to work for me. He began to work for me. Now, you can put the other red big building up. So, uh, in three years, three years, I'm out of that little raggedy building in this building and on television. Okay, okay. Now watch this, watch this. So it's in that place, I thought I had made it. No, no, see, so, so y'all trying to play me now. Y'all know that's better than that other building, you understand? I'm comparable with my peers, I got a little money in my pocket, we got a little money in the bank, and I thought I had made it. And that's when God said, oh no son, I did not teach you faith for your benefit. I taught you faith to advance the kingdom of God. And that is when God brought me in connection with the apostle. Are y'all hearing me now? Yeah, yeah. That's when I connected there. I, that's when I connected with him there. And as a result of my connection and understanding how to embrace faith, how to embrace this lifestyle. Now put the next photo, photo up there. Uh, that's, that's inside. Y'all see my TV camera back then. Let's go to the next photo. Next photo. Next photo. Wow. Somebody ought to give, to give God the praise on now, but that was, yeah. In the scope of the ministry, we were able to uh, build 750,000 square feet of properties and uh, remodel another 300 or so thousand. So we had a million square feet of property. The building in the center is the building uh, that uh, were well, 5,000 seater that we dedicated without a mortgage. Amen. Now, my, my, my kids, you know, you know, I don't try to be with them, but you know, my kids tell me, you know, they say, Big Daddy, you got receipts. Now that means, I said, well, what does that mean? You got proof. So I'm here this morning to tell you, I got proof. So you hunch the person next to you, don't let them go to sleep. If, they, if they're not bad in the eyes, when you awake, you bat your eyes. If they're not bad in the eyes, you punch, you hunch them, because these next few moments are going to be revolutionary, amen? Now, if I'm going to uh, operate in any truth, I need several things. Number one, I need a revelation. That's a comprehension of that word at the level, that's an understanding at the level of my comprehension. Number two, I need a role model. I need to see that truth lived out in the life of another. Number three, I need a regiment of faith. I need a systematic way of applying God's Word in my situation so I get the promised results. And then number four, I need a righteous resolve, a godly reason for that Word working in my life. I got three simple points, and if we're a smart class, I'll get to all of them. The first point will be the message of faith. Everybody say that. All right, say it, say it, say it, say it, say it like you mean it. Mm -hmm. So we're going to talk about understanding the message of faith, and then we're going to understand uh, the mechanics of faith. And then if we're a good class, we'll close out with the manifestations of faith. Ah, all right, all right, let's get busy. Now, our faith is based on the Word of God. Faith is based on the Word of God. First, uh, uh, Second Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, profitable for doctrine. They'll put it on the screen. Uh, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So, Scripture is for doctrine. Doctrine is the order of God. Everybody say the order of God. 
When I want to know how God works, when I want to know what God requires, I don't go ask a celebrity. I don't go look at the news. I look at the Word of God. Secondly, it is for reproof. Reproof is the dismantling of error. And many of the error that we have, we picked it up in church because we thought they knew what they were talking about because they were there before we got there. So we assumed that they had read the Bible. But there comes a day when you read it for yourself and you understand what you were thinking was all wrong. Then it is for correction. Correction is powerful. And correction is the exposure to truth, the exposure to truth, and then for instruction. That is the systematic application of that truth. And then for perfection, and that is you reach a place of maturity. Amen? Now, 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 watch this. When we talk about understanding the whole message of faith, we understand uh, that, that, that the Bible teaches the just shall, the just shall live. So it's a lifestyle. Everybody say lifestyle. lifestyle. All right. Now, here's, here's the bombshell that God, uh, uh, that God dropped on me when I'm in a little raggedy building. You understand? Understand, I've been Christian a long time. I've been preaching, you understand? I, and, then this, I'm, I'm, I, and then he tells me, I, I'm kind of upset with him. How you let my life be like this? How you let me go through all of this? Here I am, 18 years in ministry, and it's like I'm at a start over point. What's up with that, God? And then this is what he told me. He says, my will does not automatically come to pass. Okay. The will of God does not automatically come to pass. The will of God does not. Now, I thought it did because that's what they told me. They told me, whatever the Lord want to do, he'll just do anything. Well, really? Okay, here's, I, I see some of y'all going, okay, listen, is it the will of God for everybody to be saved? Will everybody be saved? So his will can't be automatic. People will not be saved because they will not do what is required to receive the salvation that's freely given. All right? And for every promise of God, for every principle, and for every prophetic word, there is, watch this, a faith process to bring it to pass. Hard for this I'm glad I hear him today. I'm glad I hear him today. Go on, tell him, I'm glad. Now, if they hit you back, not my fault. Okay, watch this. So, um, when I look at faith, I understood that for God to get involved in my situation, I have to do something. Okay, wait, wait. If, the, if God just going to do anything he want to do, why do we need to pray? Amen. If he's just going to do anything he needs, we don't need to pray. He's going to do it anyway. No, he waits for us to invite him into our situation. All right, That's, I, I won't have, have time to go to it, but in Ezekiel twenty-two thirty, 30, uh, God says, um, I sought for a man to stand in the gap. Got it? He says, so that the destruction and the judgment that was to come, I could stave it, I could wave it. But since nobody stood in the gap, the judgment had to run its course. Well, why does God need somebody? Is he going to do anything he wants to do? No, because the God of order, everybody say God of order. Because I did not say God wasn't powerful. I did not say he didn't know it all. But the God of order established an order in the earth. And then watch this. He gave authority to man. Man lost it in the God. Jesus comes back to restore that. And God now waits to get involved at man's behest. Amen. So then, with this understanding, I understood how important my faith was. I was waiting on God, and God was waiting on me. Amen and amen. So, uh, Jesus, he highlights the whole message of faith. Now, when I look at faith, I see several, several categories of faith. Everybody say saving faith. They may put that on the board. Saving faith. Yes, yeah, saving faith, faith by which we're saved. And then there's submission faith. Submission faith is that which we see when there is just submission, obedience to, uh, to the Word. Uh, we don't ever see, you know, Peter necessarily confessing the Word over and over and over. He just said, at thy Word, I will. 
all right? Then there is surrogate faith, when I'm able to use my faith on the behalf and benefit of, an, of another. The centurion did that. Everybody say, stay with him, stay with him. Then there is special faith. Special faith is a product of one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But then there's systematic faith. And systematic faith is what Jesus taught. They got it. They finally got that. Praise the Lord. Yeah. All right, watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Systematic. Everybody say systematic faith. So Mark 11, that's when Jesus is teaching systematic faith. And uh, Jesus answered and said unto them, Have faith in God, for verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe those things which he says shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he said. Therefore I say unto you what things that you desire, when you pray, believe you see them, and you shall have them. All right, now, so that's the system of faith. And when you learn the system of faith, you can learn to overcome any challenge you're facing. And I, we applaud Apostle Price for teaching us systematic faith. Amen. Now, you, you, you can't, look, 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 look. You can't be given no pity pat when I say something like that. When millions across the world have been transformed Come on, yeah. Cool. Now, watch this, watch this. this, this is. So, <clears throat> when I understood faith, and when we understand faith, a whole new world of possibilities open. Possibilities are no longer defined by what others have done. Possibilities for the believer is no longer defined by what others say. Jesus says, if thou canst believe, all things are to him. Oh, why, why, we're gonna hold, I want you to hold on to that because uh, that's, that was the key. The key was me understanding this whole believing process. So, the promises of God are, are received by faith. Problems, watch this, are resolved by faith. Potential is, re is reached by faith, and provisions are realized by faith. Amen. You got that? Now, it's okay if you want to take your camera out, take a picture of it because you can't write it down. Do whatever you going to do. <laughs> All right? But, but, but when you understand the scope of that, promises are received, problems are resolved, potential is reached, provisions are realized, you then understand the, the reality of how important faith is. All right? I got some testimonies I'm going to drop in here every now and then. Uh, but this first, first, first testimony I'm going to talk about is, uh, everybody say problems, problems. promises. Problems. <clears throat> in 19, oh, no, no, what was it? Bridge of Tempest, two, 2007, 2009, the, the jet situation. Do what? 2009, that's my historian. Uh, <laughs> 2009, I'm on my way from, uh, I'm on my way from a preaching engagement in, uh, where was I, in Carol, Carol, South Carolina? I had to come by and pick you up in Atlanta. And so, we're on our way, and at 43,000 feet, both engines go off. Both engines go off, total electrical failure, and the plane is falling. Now, see, that ain't the time to panic. That's, a, that's how you end up on the front page. That's the time to know faith. So, the plane is falling. I look in the cockpit, they got flashlights. And the devil said, I'm going to kill you. And I said to the devil, I'm not dying tonight. See, 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 the problem is you let the devil do all the talking. I say, I'm not dying tonight because the word says he satisfies me with long life and I'm not satisfied. So I start praying in the spirit, you know, because I'm, I'm coming out of this. I don't care. I don't care how you get me out. I don't care. I leave the how to him. Everybody say, leave the how to him. 
the plane is falling, and uh, uh, the Lord said, pray for your pilots. So I started praying for my pilots. He says, call on the angels. I called on the angels, but I'm cool. I, I, and listen, there's so much faith in the plane, in, 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 in the passenger. Nobody's screaming. Nobody's going, oh, my God. What? No, 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 no. We are people of faith, and we overcome by faith. Are y'all listening to me? And so, um, um, about uh, 13,000 feet, so we, we fell 30,000 feet. 13,000 feet, they got the engines on. They got the engine on, that baby leveled off. So, they said, what do you want to do? Do you want to go to a near airport, or do you want to try to make it home? I said, try. I said, no. I said, that was the enemy trying to kill us. And we kicked his butt. Can I say that? I say, and we kicked his butt. I said, now we going home. Watch this. I pushed the button on my seat, laid that baby back, and I went to sleep. Because since he slumbered, he never slumbers nor sleep. No sense in both of us being awake. You may never be in a plain situation, but in a life and death situation, remember your choice. Amen. Now, 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 now. See, we have to commit to scriptural faith. Everybody say scriptural faith. You can live by religious, what I call religious routine. Just go to church, wave your handkerchief, hallelujah, run, shout, and go back to the same problems. You can live by what I call reckless, uh, 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 random recklessness. And this is, you're so emotionally driven, sometimes up, sometimes down, sometimes almost level to the ground. You can live by, <laughs> you can live by rational responsibility. Rational responsibility. You are so intellectually astute, you understand, that embracing faith and trusting God is not a priority. After all, we know what the facts say. I got news for you. Faith changes facts. Yeah. Or you can live by what I call revelatory resolve, and that is you live by the resolve that I'm going to accomplish what the Word of God says, and by the revelation that I have from the Word of God, I have a resolve to see that lived out in my life. Amen. Can I get a better amen than that? Amen. Now, we use faith for kingdom projects. All right? Watch this. Not only kingdom projects, but kingdom promises. When I do that, it means I want you to repeat what I said. Everybody say kingdom promises. Kingdom promises. And then we use our faith for kingdom pleasures. Kingdom yeah, because God says... He wants us to richly enjoy things. He says it gives us, everybody say, enjoy life. enjoy life. Yes. So it's not just for kingdom projects, praise the Lord, and promises. God wants to bless you so your joy can be full. I know that's hard for some people to, you praise them. Uh, what? No, because they come out of a theology that God wants you to suffer, you ugly thing, you. You better be glad he saved you and going to take you to heaven. Otherwise, no. Everybody say, he wants to bless me. Everybody say, he wants me to have the best. Amen. Now, let's quickly look at the mechanics of faith. ABCs of faith is the asking, the believing, all right, and the uh, confession, saying out of your mouth what the Word of God says, the demonstration, acting out. This is a faith church, so some of these points I can go through real quickly, and then the expectation. When I'm in faith, I have five justifiable expectations. I expect a plan of action. Everybody say plan of action. I expect the wisdom of God. I expect the favor of God. I expect a miracle, and I expect strength to endure until change comes. Yeah, see, faith ain't magic. Faith is not magic, so it may take some time. But during this time of we, me waiting on the manifestation, he will strengthen me. Amen. He will strengthen me. I had never had a faith project that I did not have, to, that, that I did not have a faith fight in. 
it's common. So it's, it's like um, uh, I, I, we went to a summer camp one year, and the guy said, you know, uh, how, you, how do you deal with the persecution and, and all of this that comes with ministry? I said, easy. I said, listen. I said, um, he looked like an athlete. I said, uh, are you an athlete? He said, yes. I said, where you play? I play football. I said, what's your position? I'm a running back. I said, okay, great, great, great. Listen, when you get tackled, do you get up off the ground crying? I said, you go back to the, you know, he got me, he grabbed me by my leg, and he pulled me down. You don't do that. Why? It's part of the game. And fighting the fight of faith, it's just part of the game. Watch this. And you have to realize that you are made for that moment. Oh, my God, you got to get that. You have to realize that when God put you together, he knew your faith fight was coming. And he put everything, I'm getting too loud. I thought it would be coming. He put everything in you for the moment. I need somebody to shout, I'm made for the moment. I'm made. I'm made for the moment. Hallelujah. Amen. Okay, okay. Now, I'm getting ready to stretch. Y'all ready to stretch? I'm ready to stretch you. Because we can go through these mechanics of faith, but the main factor is the believing factor. Everybody say believing factor. When Jesus talked about faith, he talked about believing. On many occasions, he will talk about believing. But most people don't understand biblical believing. Okay. I had an old brother, and uh, he would put on my T-shirts. Growing up, he'd put on my T-shirt. Always knew when he put on my T-shirt. Because all stretched. <laughs> See, the point is, watch this, when something is stretched, it never goes back. When I stretch your faith in the next five minutes, you're not going to ever think the same again. Y'all ready? Y'all ready? All right. See, most, faith, most people think faith is reasoning on tiptoes. When they just about think how they can work it out, I meant faith. But no. Biblical believing is to accept something as a fact without sensory evidence. It's to accept it as a fact based on the Word of God without sensory evidence. Everybody say, we leave the how to Him. All right. <clears throat> the story of Thomas. Apostle Price used to always work on this one. Yeah. The story of Thomas. Uh, he says, you know, he wasn't there when uh, Jesus came and first saw the disciples. The disciples says, hey, Thomas, we've seen the Lord. Thomas, don't, don't give me that. He said, now, until I see him for myself, put my finger in that hole I saw his hand, put my hand in that hole I saw his hand, I will not believe. So then, believing is a matter of your will. You can will to believe, or you can will. All right, watch this, watch this. <clears throat> the greatest error people make in faith, not saying big greatest, but the one, one of them, okay, is flawed criteria for believing. What do you mean? See, Thomas says, here's my criteria. My criteria, I got to take my hand, put it in a hole. I got to take my finger, put it in a hole in his hand. That was his criteria. Now, when Jesus comes on the scene, come here, Thomas. And he meets his criteria, but he calls it faithlessness. <laughs> and if we don't, if we're not watching it, we will slip over into a criteria for believing that is not based on the word. Okay, okay, let's see what you think. Bible says, the blessing of the Lord make it rich. Yeah. Oh, no, I can never be rich. I, why? That man left me with all these children. I got all these mouths to feed. <laughs> Ain't got nothing to do with the world. <laughs> oh, I can never be successful. I, I, well, why? I never, I never graduated from college. But it ain't got nothing to do with the Word. So we are all guilty of, at time, from time, if we don't watch it, don't main our, uh, maintain our faith, we will substitute a criteria for believing 
It has nothing to do with the Bible. Now, I'm not condemning y'all. No, I did it. Little raggedy building, please. Please put the little raggedy building up. Put the raggedy building. Yeah. So I'm in the raggedy building. God says, watch this. You're full time, and I'm going to take care of you. I said, well, Lord, I need about 300 members. Because that was the common criteria for a successful church in my generation in that day. I need 300 members. He told, he said, who told you that? <laughs> well, all the successful members, ministers I knew had, three, had over 300 members. So I figured, I got to have, what, 300 members. It's a flawed criteria. He said, oh, no, you don't need them because you got me. Watch this, watch this, watch this, watch it. And then God said, and son, I can afford your dreams. <laughs> so I prospered right there. I prospered right there with less than 50 members. Now, I know you say you should fix that bill. You can't fix that. You got to move. <laughs> now, I heard you. I heard you. I heard you. You should have been trying to fix that building. <laughs> Bought my first brand new car there, less than 50 members. Bought Bridget the BMW, less than 50 members. Why? Because my believing shifted. He said, if you don't count the people, you will not be limited to the people you count. And I'm saying that that's what's happening a lot of time. You're looking at the news, you're hearing other people, and you're establishing a flawed criteria in your thinking that is compromising your faith. And so you got to think about it. What have I, what have I done? What am I really, am I really believing in God or favorable circumstances? Amen. Now, I'm saying, of course, you know, I didn't, praise the Lord, we didn't stay, you know, with, you know, 50 members for the rest of uh, my ministry. Amen. I think the highest we got up to was like 24,000. Amen. It was progressive, though, but I had to start believing where I was, and I watched God do amazing things. Amazing things. Okay, y'all getting quiet on me, so I'm going to have to go on and, and move forward, and move forward. All right? Ain't no problem, no problem, no problem. I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready, ready. <clears throat> now, so I'm not going to let statistical arguments talk me out of my faith. I'm not going to let sense realm arguments. Some of the greatest miracles I've seen have been when I didn't feel it. Because faith ain't got nothing to do with how you feel has everything to do with what you believe, all right? I'm not going to let signs, you know, uh, arguments, I'm not going to let that deter my faith, how things look, nor will I allow specialists, <laughs> the specialist argument, they, I, I'm, 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 I've gone down in my page, they're going to put them up in a minute when they catch up with me, see? Yeah, they're going to they put them up, they're going to put them up in a minute when they catch up, all right? And that is when the specialists say something. See, we have more confidence in the specialists than we have in God. No, a professional will tell us something, and we'll go, oh, I guess you're right. <laughs> Not if God said different. <laughs> See, when are we going to shift and believe in the God we praise about? On, believe in the God, watch this, of the Bible. And not the God of religion. Yes. Amen. I just work for preachers when they believe in for the Bible. No, no, no. Um, I had a little, and I'm, I'm a little raggedy building. I got a, when I started walking in faith, um, I had a little raggedy car. They called it the bomb. They said that thing gonna blow up in any moment. <laughs> That's all right, no problem. See, I understand you don't try to use your faith to shut up critics. I'm all right with my, with my car. I'm believing God for a new car. You know, I'm confessing. You know, I'm sowing seed. And then one day God tells me on a Sunday morning, stand up and tell the people next week you'll have a brand new car. Well, I said it before I thought about it. 
And then when I thought about it, I went, now how that's gonna happen? I mean, I have no credit, I have no cash, and no consistent income. Everybody said, but God said it. Now, I'm gonna have to choose to whether I'm gonna believe God or believe, everybody say, other things. All right, now watch this. So I put my little package together and I go to banks, all these banks. You know, you look in the paper, they say they're ready to lend money. Blah, blah, blah. I go to all of them and all of them say no. <laughs> then this last one, Dr. Betty, I'm, I'm making my presentation. He picks a lamp off the cloth. <laughs> so you through? I say yes. He says, you will never get a new car. You don't have any money. Your church is small. You don't have consistent income. You don't have any credit. The best thing you can do is go to one of those used car lots and buy one of those cars where they write the price on the top, on the windshield. I was so dejected. Because this is the bank. He's a specialist. So I go back to the church. I get on my knees. God, you told me to announce that. You told me I'd have a new, I have, I'd have a new car by Sunday. I say, God, I'm in all these banks. All of them turned me down. You know what he said to me? You never asked me which bank to go to. <laughs> well, I'm a fast learner. Okay, God, which one? I've been riding all over town, and my favor is about a mile and a half away from my church. I get up off my knees. Now, I'm going to tell y'all, I wouldn't believe some of my testimonies if I hadn't lived them. I'm going to tell you. I, wouldn't, I really wouldn't believe some if I hadn't lived them. I get off of my knees. I go to the bank. I walk in the door, and the banker walks up to me and says, Preacher, what can I do for you today? <laughs> now, he's been to my church to testify, so this, not a, this ain't no testimony, you understand? <laughs> How you know I'm a preacher? I do not know. I go in his office, and I tell him. He says, I told him I need a car. He said, what kind of car? Well, I said, I want a Mercedes. You get a Mercedes one day, what's your next choice? <laughs> now see, watch it. This is a good point. God sent me to him. I don't need to argue with this man. And oh, now you're trying to t take my dream away. I bind you in the name of Jesus. He goes, say, would you go out that door, please? <laughs> no. He said, what's your next choice? I said, Cadillac. He said, you get a Cadillac one day. What's your third choice? I said, Buick Park Avenue, fully loaded. He said, great choice. <laughs> Go find it, bring it to me. I found it, bring it, I found it, bring it to me. He said, how much, how much down payment yet? He never checked my credit. This guy never checks my credit. And he says, uh, you got down, what kind of down payment yet? I said, I don't have any, but you do as much as you can. He did this calculation. He said, I could do 92% of this car. All you need is 8%. And then the Lord spoke to me. He says, go tell the dealership to wait for 8% until Monday morning. I call the salesman. I says, I need y'all to wait. He said, no, no, we don't do business like that. When you got the money, you get the car. I said, I don't need to talk to you then because you're not my personal favor. I don't care who you talk to. Around. I said, listen, I'm on my way up there. I came up there. When I drove up in my little ragged smoking car, they all was laughing at me, and they pointed where the general manager was. I walk in the general manager's office, and I said, my banker is trusting me for the next three years for 92% of this car. I need you to trust me until Monday morning for the 8%. Yeah. This man passed, he didn't pass any words with me. He didn't say, well, write me a check and I'll hold it. He reached across the desk. I see him right now. Shook my hand, preacher, you got a deal. <laughs> with the other hand, he picks up the phone and calls make ready. This is Friday evening. Get this man, get, get this preacher's car ready. He got to have it for Sunday morning. <laughs> Everybody shout, it is no secret, is no secret. What, God what God can do. What God does for one, does for one. In, principle, in principle, he will do for another. Do for another. Amen and amen and amen. amen. Don't let the specialist talk you out of your miracle. Yes. All right, let's close with the manifestations of faith. Because if you walk by faith and you hold and you embrace it, 
you're going to have manifestations. And your manifestations will inspire others. Just as the manifestation of the faith in this place has inspired millions of people across the world, your faith is going to inspire others. Amen. Look at the person next say, God is about to do something supernatural in your life just to encourage my faith. <laughs> Give the Lord a shout on now. That's a good shout. All right. Now, most people think that when the manifestation occurs, it's over. But no, God is looking how I deal with the manifestations. He's looking at the stewardship that I exercise with the manifestations. So, when the, the psalmist says, what shall I render unto the Lord? What he's saying is, what do I owe God for what he does for me? Everybody say, I owe God. Amen. All right, number one, I owe God to touch others. Shout that, I owe God, I owe God. To, touch to touch others. Number two, I owe God to teach others. And that is what uh, Apostle Price did so effectively. Thank God he was not just a model, he was a mentor. What I tell y'all, y'all gonna let me say something about Apostle Price and he gonna give me no pity pat. I already told you about that. God expects us to train others. He expects us to make disciples, and God expects us to testify to others. Our, test our personal testimony is powerful. Amen? Amen? Now, let's look at the pathways of manifestations. Now, this is not an exhaustive list, but it is a good list. How does God work to bring the manifestation? Number one, when we have faith and believe, we can expect the intervention of angelic supernaturals. We need to believe in angels. Amen. Number two, we expect the intervention of advantageous strategies. God gives you strategy. Everybody say strategies. See, when I'm in faith, I'm believing God for a strategy. I'm not just a hope we need to pray. No, I am believing God to give me a strategy. Proverbs 16 and 3 says that when I roll this work on the Lord and I commit my works to him, he, watch this, will cause my thoughts to be agreeable with his will, so shall my plans be established and succeed. I'm expecting God to work through assigned supporters. That is the purpose of my seed, faith giving, that he will raise up others. The grace of God, the favor of God is the willingness of others to use their power, their ability, and their influence to help you. Hold on to that. Because, see, most people don't understand the whole favor dynamic. And the whole favor dynamic is that God's going to work through somebody. He has assigned somebody to help you. Oh, come on, you got to believe that. No. He has a sign. The Bible says uh, <laughs> that, you know, the faithful and the righteous will rendezvous with favor, will uh, compass the bout with favor. That means God's got people on my path ready to help me, and I'm on, I I'm about to connect with them. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm going to preach over here, y'all. <laughs> no, no, you got to believe that God knows your situation. And watch this. He will not let you be in that situation, watch this, without a deliverance plan for you. That is why we don't have pity parties. That is why, you know, we don't throw up. Listen, I don't need to know now what I'm going to do. He will give me what to do on a need-to-know basis. When I need to know, I'm going to know. When my heart is right toward God and my desire is to please God, God is obligated to bring me to the company of the people I need to know and the knowledge of the things that I need to know that are critical for my success and my destiny in life. Yeah. Hallelujah. You're on your way to rendezvous to meet up with somebody God has already assigned to help you. 
Okay, let me see. The intervention of amazing supply. When God calls us what you have, that you didn't think it was enough, he causes it to meet your need anyway. He intervenes through, intervenes through adversarial shifts. Oh, my God. Whew. What's an adversarial shift? What the devil meant for evil. God. <laughs> he takes that thing and promotes you with it. Did it at the Red Sea. Killed Pharaoh and all of his, all, and, and his whole armies. He did it on the battlefield. Amen. <laughs> Amen. David picks up Goliath's sword and cuts off his head. God is amazing how he will cause an adversarial shift that what the devil meant for evil, a shift takes place. Watch this. It happened at the fiery furnace. Ha! Glory to God. The fire that was meant to burn up the, the three Hebrew boys end up consuming their enemies. I'm telling you, we serve the same God. I declare over your life that things are about to shift. And the thing that the devil attempted to use to get you worried and distressed, that thing is going to shift in your favor. <laughs> He intervenes through the alleviation of struggle. Because once you know God's on the scene, there's this peace that comes over you. And you know that you know that you know you're coming out on top. Amen. He intervenes. He intervenes through, watch this, appropriate strengthening. What do you mean? What do you mean? That he gives me the appropriate strength for the moment. I thought I couldn't make it any further. I thought I was all out, but I get my second win. And when I get my second win, you better look out. You better look out. Do I have any athletes in the house? Athletes in the house know that you can be running a race. And at that, in that race, at, at the point where your lungs are burning, where you don't think you can make another step, something happens phenomenally that you get a second win, a new burst of energy. I'm telling you today that that's what God does when you live by faith and you're in a faith fight. That comes this burst of energy. Everybody say, my second win. <laughs> Finally, whoo, I got accelerated success. It won't take long. Whew. Everybody say it won't take long. Oh, my God, my God, it won't take long. All right, now, watch. Okay, let's see if I can maximize these next few minutes. See, I have to learn how to maintain my faith. So you can get faith, get some victories, blah, 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 blah. But if you don't watch it, you don't maintain it. It's almost like you regress. Simple. Maintaining your faith. It's simple. Everybody say simple. simple. I maintain my faith through the management of truth. What do you mean? I got to make sure that I'm around somebody who's teaching me truth. I cannot afford to just go somewhere where they're going to shout me, run me. Faith comes by. And hearing by, and so I don't care. I mean, y'all can go shouting and all that sort of stuff. I say, you know, listen, give me the truth of God's Word. I shout later. When I began to follow Apostle Price years ago, all the preachers said, you'll never preach in the National Baptist Convention. You'll never I said, no problem. My church every Sunday morning will be a convention. <laughs> don't you let nobody, don't you let anybody talk you out of truth. Number two, my faith is maintained. Whoo, glory. Through the management of my thoughts. I got to be around people who are going to help me control my thoughts. It is maintained, watch this, through the management of my, they have them over there, the management of my temperament. Oh my God. 
I got to tell you, I wish I could put y'all in a capsule and take y'all back to me in a little raggedy building. Everything, everybody think I'm cool now and just kind of, you know, smooth now. The boy was smooth back then. Listen, he had one shiny suit. That's all I had. But I had a strut about me. I know I'm on my way somewhere. You understand? I have seen my future on the canvas of my imagination. No sense of me being a, in having a pity party for where I am. This was only temporary. Management of my temperament. The Bible says in Philippians 1.28, it says, and in nothing terrified by your adversary. And when, you, when you're not terrified by your adversary and you have this victorious stance, you send a message to him that he's going down. And you send a message to heaven that I'm dependent on you. I'm not talking about fake it until you make it. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about having faith because you're going to make it. Amen. All right, watch this. Management of my tongue. I got to watch my mouth. Death and life is in the... Amen. I got to manage my treasure. Everybody say my treasure. Now, faith really shows out in challenging moments. We can always go to school and say, but it's in the challenging moment when you have to exercise faith, that's the real test. And in those moments, the average believer will choke. Now, I know choking, you know, choking, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, it's, it's a colorful term that we mean, that, that what we mean, that that person will hesitate. Well, well, well I don't know. But that's common to those who grow in faith. Everybody say choking moments. Beyond every choking moment where you have to rethink your commitment at that moment, beyond that is a supernatural move of God. Now, at the end of the service, when I ask those persons who raise their hands to come forward, they will possibly experience a choking moment. I don't know where I want to go up there. I don't want some people looking at me. That's because when the enemy knows how close you are to your breakthrough, he bombards your life, your mind, so that you can self-sabotage, but not today. Choking moment is a moment of temptation. It's a moment of truth, but then more than anything, it's a moment of transition. It's a moment where you step over into the supernatural. Happened for me years ago at an Apostle Price crusade in Houston, Texas, at uh, the Lakewood campus, it was Brother Osteen had built the building, and the crusade was there. That last night, the budget wasn't met, and Apostle Price said, the budget in Houston didn't meet their budget. And of course, everybody was somber. And then the Lord said to me, I want you to meet the budget. Now, I had it, but I didn't have it for that. <laughs> so I was saving some money for a down payment on the house, and we had finally got a person who was going to lend, bank going to lend the money, but they, we had to come up with a significant down payment, and I'm putting my money back, putting my money back, and now the Lord is asking me for some of my down payment money. <laughs> Everybody say he choked. <laughs> See, listen, if you don't obey God quickly, you talk yourself out of it. So I said, well, I've already given. I've given all week long. I gave tonight. And then watch this. I said, I ain't asked him to come no way. <laughs> Are y'all going to judge me? Y'all going to judge me? Y'all judge me? I, said, I, ain't asked, I ain't asked him to come. <laughs> about that time, Bridget hit me. Boom. Did the Lord say something to you about the budget? <laughs> more minutes. You have five more minutes. So, I say yes, but let's do half. Say you know better than that. I raised my hand. Pastor Price said, he, he, he pointed me, I said, my wife and I will personally meet the budget tonight. Everybody went wild. Ah, oh, praise the Lord, the budget's met. Except me. Something. 
devil said right here, say, you fool. What you going to do when you get to closing? You going to lose all of And so I got to, for the rest of the night, I hear nothing. I'm casting down Jesus' name, blood of Jesus, hallelujah. Uh. But it was a transition moment. We, when service was over, people started walking up to me and Bridget, giving us money. Wow. We're so happy you didn't let Houston go down and not meet their budget. So I said, well, praise the Lord. <laughs> Yeah. Hallelujah, you understand? Now, sh people doing the same thing to her. I praise, oh, thank you, Jesus. You understand? So I said, at first I was walking like this here, and then I said, oh my God, this is something happening. So I just started taking baby steps. Like. When we got home and counted it, it was what we gave away which meant the budget was in the house. Secondly, watch this. I had a Bible study that uh, in another part, I couldn't get five people to come to Bible study. After I sowed that seed, God said, now it's time to open the church in the South. I'm always, God, have you seen the Bible study? He said, go get the largest building you can find. We found an old Kroger building. And uh, we, 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 uh, when we put our application in for it to, to lease it from them, I found, they found out that my secretary had been the president's secretary. So what he said, he liked her work so much, they paid for the remodeling and gave us free rent for a period. Everybody said, don't choke, don't choke. Watch this, watch this. I have an older daughter who had been raised by her mother as a Jehovah's Witness. She wouldn't let me see her, even though the court order said she should. But we decided we were going to take her to court. That was a higher court. We sowed that seed. Two weeks later, I got a call from Tina's mother. Tina says, Tina's mother said, come get your child. Huh? Not come visit. I'm giving her to you. Ain't nobody happy with me tonight. Ain't nobody happy with me. What if I had choked? Watch this. You want to see a greater miracle? The place where I gave that seed. Yes, sir. The place where I sowed that seed to meet the budget. That place we now own. To rebuild it would have cost us that time $41,000. We, we bought it for $15,000, but actually only paid 12 million for it. 15 million, we only paid 12 million for it. We said, how you do that? Because, I don't have time for that testimony. Oh, they gave me a little more time. I'm, I'm, I'm wrapping up, I'm wrapping up, I'm wrapping up, I'm wrapping up. So we agreed to 15 million. And because uh, they said, whatever you want to pay. Huh? Whatever. We had already offered them 23, but uh, 23 million, you know, negotiation broke down. And so they said, family said, whatever you want to pay. Put the key on the table. I said, I pray about it. I came back and I said, 15 million. My lawyer said, you should have said less than that. They said, I said, no, I'd rather have it at 15 million and God help me pay for it. And then I asked for some other and God tell me to pay for it. <laughs> so what happened, what happened was they carried back a note of 3 million. We, took, we put 2 million down. And uh, the, the 3 million had no interest, no payment for, I think, two or three years. And um, I think maybe a year later, God said, Offer them a million dollars in 90 days and ask them if they will cancel the other two. Other, yeah, the other two. And they did. So they canceled two million. Watch this. Then they were still having their offices there. So they said, uh, until we move our offices, how much are you going to charge us? I said, I can, I can you, whatever y'all want to pay. They gave us $100,000 every month for a year. What if I had choked that night? and not obeyed God. See, when you hear the word of God, there are several responses. 
You can have a resentful response like the rich young ruler, or you can have a ready response like Bartimaeus says, I'm ready. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus.